Hi, my name is Julie Patterson and I've got a design business called Cloth Fabric. I hand print fabric for upholstery and today I'm going to talk you through step by step how I get from an initial idea to a printed fabric. So I will be doing some very experimental drawings based on these plants. Maybe not all of them, but some of them. So as a textile designer, the most important thing, I think, is to be original and authentic in your design development. There's a lot of copying and influence out there. And the thing, the core, I believe, uh, to learn at, as a student is to tap into your authentic self. So the best way to do that as a textile designer is to develop a drawing habit, literally carrying a sketchbook wherever you go and taking notes, making drawings, trying to capture the light and the detail of your daily life is a way to express your unique experience in the world. So what I'm going to be uh, talking about a lot and focusing on and demonstrating a lot is the joy of drawing and the looseness and intu intuition that you, you can um, develop by just being a little free and drawing what you see. And basically, the more you draw, the better you get at it. And I want to encourage people just to work with what they've got. Um, and it's the idea and the passion behind the idea that is the most important thing, not the materials that you use. Uh, this is my print paste. It's like single cream, well, thickened single cream perhaps. Um, and these are my concentrates that I work with. So I put a drop of that into this thick binder to create my colours. So I never use colours straight from the uh, pot. I will be mi mixing them. It's very important for me to get the colour to reflect what it is I'm working on. This is the plant I'm going to be working with. I'm studying the pieces and it, and it splits off, it splits off and it splits off. So basically you could focus on a really small piece um, and you're not going to get any, it's going to be exactly the same as the, the big version of it, if you know what I mean. So I'm just going to focus on that small bit at the end there and I'm going to snap it off, which seems a bit mean. Actually that one I'll use. There. Lay that down on the table like that. And the other one I will use as my stick. So I always encourage people to try and work with exactly the materials that they're looking at. I'm trying to get the essence of this, um, this plant. This is just ordinary old drawing ink, nothing fancy. And I'm looking at shape and form and repetition. That's the most important thing. And I'll be doing lots and lots of drawings just to get the essence of what I can see. And clearly it's not a, an accurate interpretation, but it's a, it's a sense of the plant. So that's one. So, and I also encourage people to just keep on drawing. And if you're not happy with that, try something else. This table's going to get filthy. And I'm looking at the proportion of this to this. So that's like two thirds, one third perhaps. So I might rotate my piece of paper around that way. And then those shapes, but they're not circular, they've got a fatter bottoms and top. That kind of thing is important to get the essence of what it is we're looking at. And they all come together with a little bit of a curve there. Here's my finger to get that fatness. And it's got a really nice little sort of texture going through there. That so I'm not worrying too much about the outcome of, of where I'm going um, next. This is just about having a nice time translating what I see. My finger is often the, end, the, the, the uh, tool that I use the most. Okay. One of the key uh, situations that a student often um, 
happens upon is that they don't really look at what they're actually trying to draw. They, they, they draw what they think they are looking at, if that makes sense. So if you turn something upside down, it's, you're more likely to really study. I'm looking at the interaction there. These paintbrushes are a lot calmer. Uh, it's not about uh, colour at this point, it's just about form. And twiddling your paintbrush around to try and get all the different facets of that. I'm looking at the interaction, the essence of the piece. Just reminded me the paint, the ink rolling down the, ta the page is a really nice way of drawing as well. Just letting the ink flow. Another way of drawing would be to uh, draw with your eyes closed or with your left hand. I'm going to do a little drawing with my left hand, see what happens there. because I am right-handed. So let's see what happens. Straight away your lead breaks, pressing too hard. So it's, what I'm trying to do is to shake up the, your typical way of wanting to draw, try to get the essence of something, the energy of the plant that I'm looking at, rather than a slavish copy. You've got to be able to uh, just keep on going and, and sort of stop yourself um, being critical of your own work, which is quite hard sometimes, but just keep on keeping on. The textures, I'm going to stick with the ink, I think. This, to me, is quite an inky this plant. It's got those little hairy bits that come out like that. And very often, or all the time actually, I will draw um, my subject matter over and over and over, about 15, 20 times to really try and uh, understand the way the plant grows. Because the more you understand it, the more you can, be, you can interpret it in a loose way, but in an accurate way, if that makes sense. start to understand the rhythm. This, this plant to me seems to have clusters of threes. So I think I'll do one more drawing and then I'll review what we've got. So, you know, another way to do this would take a photograph and put it into Photoshop, but you wouldn't get the personality of you and your interpretation of the plant if that's the way you went. I find going straight into a computer program is a very sterile way of um, designing, and it's a very generic way as well. It's becoming a very generic way. You can become a master of, you know, your Photoshop and your Illustrator, but it's, um, there's nothing that really beats that hand-eye coordination thing, the interpretation of what you can see in front of you. Because ultimately we're going to be, I'm going to be translating this into a three colour print prototype design. And this is stage one. This is the most important stage. This is what I'll take the most time emphasising because the more unique you work here, the more unique your end result's going to be, and that is a good thing for a designer, a textile designer, is your uniqueness and your um, um, sense of identity and your handwriting. It all starts here. This is the most important part. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
It's, this is an opportunity um, to move from a sense of subjectivity to objectivity. Now, we all have a subjective perspective of our work. We're internally thinking, it's, oh, is that going to work? Is that any good? I don't think it's. I don't. I think this drawing's rubbish. It's so. I want. What I'm interested in is shifting from that space to a place where you'll go. Okay, I can imagine that drawing being applied to the next stage. So I went for a little break came back and made the decision that this, in fact, was the drawing that I would like to um, use for my demonstration. And I think the reason is that all those runny bits of ink actually are really energetic and um, unique to the, the piece. So this is my, what I call my master copy, and as I go through the printing, I will be referring back to this drawing as my plan of action. So, and because I'm making it, a, turning in this, in, this drawing into a three color print, um, I'm just choosing three arbitrary colors, just as long as they're different to each other, and indicating on this plan uh, the order in which I'm printing and the things that are gonna be on the same level. It's, it's like layers in, in um, in Photoshop or Illustrator really. So there's the, everything is printed on top of itself in different elements and you see, and there's a translucency so you can see the different layers come together. I'm not sure if that makes sense to you, but for instance, I will be that shape there. I know that that is one of these, one of these plants. I know that that's got that kind of shape to it. So I'm sticking, very closely to my original mark that I made, but just adding some shape around there. So when I come to cut that stencil, I know what I'm doing. Same with that one there. That one there. It's like an x-ray almost, this drawing, this thing, and, uh, this uh, master plan. And I also know that I'm not, I don't want to get confused with that little, t that came in from a different drawing, so I'm just going to Ignore that bit, so it's, this is what I'm focusing on. And then, because the cut paper stencil, there's some restrictions in if you cut every little shape. So basically I'm cutting that shape out and I will be bringing colour back into it. If I cut everything out, the whole thing will fall apart like a stencil obviously does. So I, I need to make decisions as to where things stop and start. So this will have a line there and then I'll put the other piece coming through there. It may not make sense to you at this point in time but that's okay. It'll come clear later on. So everything that I'm sketching like this is all part of the same stencil. I think this is how I'm going to do it. I may change my mind later but it'll all make sense if I do comes down like that and this one will go up like that. Being loose and, and intuitive and interpretive like this means that you don't really know where you're going so it can be a little bit daunting but fun at the same time and really lots of energy because the, the less you have a fixed idea at the end, the less of a fixed idea you have, the better the outcome because you're just not quite sure what's going to happen next, quite frankly. So I do a little legend here. So this will be um, color one. This will be color two. This will be color three. And I think I'm going to be putting a fourth color in because what I really like are these little empty spaces here and you can't bring an empty, you have to, I'd have to overprint that on top. So, so these, these little shapes here will be colour four. And these are these sort of the highlights. So you write note, notes on this. And also, it's important so you know how to orientate when you're printing. Always put top left 
in the corner. That's what I do anyway, then I, I don't get confused if things are upside down, inside out, back to front, that kind of thing. Okay, so I think I know, so that's the same one. So that's that one. So that is number two, that is number two, that is number two, that is number two. That's number one, I think. One, one, that's two. That is three. I won't necessarily do every single piece in there, otherwise I'll be here for a week. So we're just doing a modified version. And these little bits there are colour four. Okay, that's my master copy sorted. Okay, so the next stage is to trace my drawing um, from the master copy onto the stencil paper. So each colour, now decided that there's going to be four colours, um, each colour has its own stencil. This stencil paper, or Yuppo paper, you get it from um, local art shops, it's about $8 for a really big sheet and you can keep using it over and over again as long as you're not too rough with your um, wiping down. So I'm going to go for colour number one Hopefully there's enough on there. And the other thing is it's very forgiving. So you can kind of, if it doesn't quite fit in, you can just turn it sideways and you're ready to go. So I'm now focusing only on drawing with a waterproof texture. Very important that it's not a water soluble texture because otherwise the, the ink will go all over your print. So waterproof texture. And looking for the orange lines that I've got, not that one there, all right? So here we go. And you don't want to be really too close to the edge of the stencil because, well, you'll find out later on, actually. So now I'm trying to be as accurate as I can, no pressure, on the marks that I made with that ink, which was very fluid and free. And so I'm just trying to retain as much of that fluid drawing as I can. Keep flicking underneath to see where you're going. This one here. Generally, I use a window for this. You don't need a light box. It's just that we're in a room that doesn't have windows in, so I've chosen a light box. Now, that one there. Actually, no, I can put that in. All I will do is I'll create a bridge so it doesn't all get too flappy when I cut the stencil. So I will keep to my original plan. I'll show you what I mean. Rather than going all the way to the bottom there, I'm just gonna stop when I cut this. That, that little bridge there will be a really important supporting act. Okay, I think that is all color one. So again, I put top left in the corner so I know which direction everything's facing. And I'll put colour one. So that's colour one. Now I'll go through all of them. Now for the cutting. So I've got my uh, watercolour sketch roughs here. Um, they've mostly dried now and I'm going to um, translate what I think three colours from there with a highlight colour to bring back into this design. It's not going to look like this, this is just my working uh, sketch. Now because all these colours that I work with are translucent, I have to work from light to dark, So, the, uh, unless I work with an opaque, but mostly I start with a, 
um, a lighter tone and then put a darker tone on top if I'm over printing because this shape here is going to be printing over the top of those shapes there and it builds up in layers and so you need to be able to see that um, over the top of the other ones if you know what I mean. So I'm going to go all out there and I think originally I was thinking in my mind oh it's going to be a dark mid-grey kind of twig print but I think I'm going to go that I really like this rust colour which happens to be that colour there which it's kind of taken from the, the leaves there. So I'm going to use that for colour one, I think. And roughly, I think I might, this colour two is going to be um, uh, that one there, although that's lighter than that one. So, But they don't overprint, so that doesn't matter. That's fine, yes. And then the third one, the big shapes on top, I think will be quite dark. It'll be maybe not as dark as that, but it'll be um, a sort of charcoal colour uh, to give it a nice bit of grunt because when you see these in nature, they really, it's the, those shapes that really stand out. And then the fourth colour, which is the highlight shape, will be a, probably a soft grey, um, opaque, but I'll leave that later. So I'll keep this quite loose. The first colour I put down is the, most, the, the only decision I'm going to make first now then I respond as I go through. So it's very intuitive and quite loose. We'll be using a commercial screen print paste on the top and the, the basic um, uh, paste is the translucent um, acrylic polymer that I then put these um, tinters in. You need the tiniest amount to go, it goes very far. Now you can go to an art shop and buy them pre-mixed. Those colors are really intense and uh, there's something about them they're really hard to work with so I much prefer to work with the this is like the the water component of watercolor so it, it, it's also called extender so it takes a color and sort of spreads it so I'm just going to be mixing this by eye most people would probably use those very fine scales my, my printer does because um, these all these prototypes I just do it all by eye send it off to my printer and he will match and the recipe he creates comes with a, with a set of scales in milligrams and uh, I'm not that accurate. So I'm going to use my hand and try and get one dot, that's more than one dot. Um, mix it up, oh yum. This is really like a cooking show now, isn't it? See, it feels like it's got a, a, a cloudiness to it. That will go eventually, That's once it's dry it won't happen. It's, got a, it's very translucent. I stick my finger in. It's very soft, so I will put a couple more drops. So you build it up gradually, because it's nothing worse than having it too strong and having to go backwards. Now this color is a lovely, it's called Venetian Red. Um, it's quite a tertiary color, so it's not, I'm, I'm starting with a, Tertiary colour meaning there's more than one primary colour to make it that lovely dirty red. That's not too bad. When it'll dry a little um, lighter, so I'm going to add a little tiny bit more. And I might just. Should I put some. I was going to put some red in there, but I don't know if I want to. I might keep it as it is. So I'll just blast that with a hairdryer, see what colour it comes out. Excuse me. Okay, so I'm ready to print my first colour. I do everything one step at a time, just in case I change my mind with colours. We use a very simple roller from the hardware shop. Foam roller, this has been used a lot of times. They're really, really good for exactly what I'm doing here. They cost about $4 or something like that, really cheap and effective. Put it on the plate. Now the, the thing that people generally, the mistake that people generally make is they load their roller up too much and it gets really squishy and it turns it into a disaster area over there. So there's a sweet spot and you might be able to hear it. It's like a little mushy sound. See if you can hear this. I'm not sure if that is picked up on the 
microphone. But that is pretty much fully loaded. You don't want it to go any more than that, if it, otherwise it will start skidding. It's also that texture on the plate there, and that's just about the right amount. You go backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards, load up the roller. Now then, this is quite a tricky one to demonstrate because it's there's lots of vertical line. Um, so hopefully I'll get it right. And the other thing I need to point out here is you don't want to put the placement right. I'm making a repeating pattern, basically. I didn't say that before. So whatever happens at, down here needs to happen up there and vice versa, just as a rough idea. In my mind, I'm imagining that I've this is a piece of fabric off a big roll of fabric that's been printed. And I want to, the, the point I'm making is about composition and placement. If you plonk it in the middle, you're going to have trouble either side and it's going to look too obvious. So because this has got such a strong diagonal, I'm going to put it on the diagonal in that corner and let the design or let the placement flow from my response to what I've actually drawn. Now, make sure that it's not dried up. I hold this uh, stencil paper in, um, with the, and move my hand in the opposite direction. because So the, tr the, the hard thing about this is keeping the stencil paper under control. So I like to do it in small little movements. The other thing about this fabric, by the way, it's, it's called PFP, prepared for printing. So it's been washed already, so it's not going to shrink. So you just sort of kiss it into the gaps, not too many times, otherwise it will spread underneath. Hold it firm. Move your fingers. Now that little flappy bit there is a potential tricky, tricky one. So you just need to uh, hold that down. Oops. This fabric is very nice to print on. It soaks it in lovely. So it's better to have a bit of texture showing through rather than too much print paste because it'll bleed otherwise. All right. Then you lift it up and you see what you've got. A bit of a rusty color bunch of lines. Now comes where do I place it next? So what do I do? What I do now is refer back to the original drawing. I want to put the other set of lines down. And I put that in, the, in that direction. And I know that I've got a grey line to fit there and one in the middle there. So pretty much this is all about the rust coloured lines. It creates the, the, the structure. So I'm going to now place it down again, looking at that drawing. And I think what I might do is bring this right in there because I want the, the composition to flow and to be connected. A very common mistake is to put a placement there and there and there and there and you've got all this empty space. And also I know that this plant naturally grows with this kind of lean, it gets really tall and gangly, so I want to kind of emphasize the lean of the, of the way that that plant grows. So I'm just going to place that one there. So I'm choosing now a colour to go with the rust and um, I don't know if it's actually on, yes it's that one, Auntie Pam, I name them in very strange, strange names. So this is Auntie Pam and that's that colour there, just in there and I'm just wondering whether it may be a little soft so I'm just going to add the tiniest of a dark, dark grey. And if I want the tiniest of a dark, dark grey, I won't pour it straight into the pot, I'll put it on a spoon. You see straight away there's too much there, so I just want the tiny, tiny couple of dots because this is quite a soft colour. Mix that in. We'll probably make it go a little bluer. That's well, quite a lot darker, isn't it? But that's okay because it's a very strong shape, so I'm not... Oh yeah, that's good, that's good. That's a nice colour. I'm happy with that. Getting that lovely kissy noise. Top left. Whoa, I had that upside down. Very important to orientate 
the stencil because I'm trying, I'll be placing by eye. So the, the print, I'm, the colour I'm putting down now connects that one, those two shapes and those two shapes. So it's there and there. I've got to identify that on this print. That's quite a difficult job. Okay, that will do for now. I might add, come back later on and add some more, I could if I wanted to, of these sticks, because it's, you know, it's the density of the bush that I'm trying to achieve. But I'm going to now move on to um, my next colour. So now what I'm now doing is filling in, looking at the design and seeing where the holes are. There are quite a few holes. I would like to spend more time filling, filling in the shapes to make them a little bit more connected. It feels a little bit floaty to me. Um, but just for the purpose of this demonstration, I'm going to put the fourth colour in. So this is quite unresolved still, which is, which is good, which is how it is with a prototype design. It needs. Um, working and reworking until you, you're happy with it. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll put the fourth colour in now. Just that little highlight colour and then we'll be done. This is a highlight colour that I'm putting in the little cracks in here. And because there's not very much of it, I can mix it directly on the plate. One of the joys of this uh, process is the, the slight misregistration on purpose so that everything has kind of a, a slight awkwardness um, it, and that's the advantage of um, hand printing over digital printing is that it, it uh, shows the, the inconsistencies of the, um, the handmade product. From the original source material from my garden, I did the inky sketches, Fast and Furious. I, broke it down to a four colour print, I did my prototype. Now the prototype is very much a work in progress that I will like to refine and work on. The key thing that I would stress here though is I, move, I feel myself moving into this, that subjective territory of not knowing whether it's got potential or not. So what I do is I put it aside for a couple of weeks and surprise myself with it. And then if I see it again and I think, oh, I know exactly what I need to do with this, with this design, it's moving from the subjective to the objective and I get a sense of agency around what I need to do. So this is just probably three quarters of the way finished. Um, and you know, that's, that's, how, that's how these things go. And I wanted to give you an example of uh, a prototype design that I did 25 years ago. This is a corner of a, an acacia um, flower, um, a wattle, that again was the same sort of thing. I, I, had, I, I did this, I had it sitting around for a month or two and then eventually the right time came and, I, and that turned into one of my best-selling wattle designs that happens to be in my book. The whole process that I've just described is all written in here. Oh, it's just open to wattle. There you go. That's good, isn't it? So there's, again, there's the wattle, there's the drawing, and that's the finished design. That was the first prototype for it. So it's a full circle, a, a cyclical kind of design process, very organic, very intuitive, and um, I hope you've enjoyed it and got some sense out of what I've been saying. Thank you. <laughs>